right, hello everybody, and there are a lot of you out there. Welcome to the very first day of South by Southwest. I am so excited. So, my name is Monica Sack. I am the Senior Director of Conference Programming for South by Southwest. Thank you all so much for making it to this year's event. I hope that your time here is spent full of learning, making connections, reflecting, exploring, and all of the other things that you all want to accomplish. Before we get to our opening session, I just have a few uh, housekeeping items for you all. First, we are live streaming a select uh, number of sessions each day, so if you're unable to attend for any reason, you can check out our live stream on YouTube. Second, as you may have noticed, there are a lot of you here um, which means that a lot of sessions are going to be at capacity and you're unable to attend or get into the room. We do have a select number of sessions that we will be encoring, so check the schedule for that. And even if you're unable to make those, check out a different room, like walk into something that you didn't think that you would be interested in seeing and um, discover, 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 which is what we want you all to do here. Um, third, to celebrate our first day of the event, we have the South by Southwest Interactive Opening Party at 8 p.m. That will be at Palm Door at 6th, on 6th, and I hope to see you all there. And now on to our first session of the event, and it is a great one. When I think about our world, I think about how the perception of it is constantly changing. It can feel small or big comforting or harsh, familiar or foreign. And the shifting of those thoughts is what keeps this world a mystery for me. I can't capture how I feel in words, but I don't have to because our opening session today is gonna do that for us. Ada Limon is a poet, our nation's poet laureate, to be exact. She comes with many accomplishments, MacArthur Award recipient, one of Time's Women of the Year, just to name a couple. And just generally, she's amazing. And we are so fortunate this morning to get a glimpse of how she sees the world. Dr. Lori Glaze is the director of NASA's Science Mission Directorate's Planetary Science Division. So let's just say equally amazing. <laughs> Lori will be joining for the second half of the session to discuss the intersection of science, culture, exploration, and so much more. And there may be a few treats along the way. So if you have any questions, we are accepting them through the Slido platform. You can find that in the South by Southwest Go app. Just go to the session listing and click on the Engage button. Following today's session at 11.30, Ada will be doing a book signing at the South by Southwest bookstore. She'll be signing copies of her most recent um, book of poetry, The Hurting Kind. And now, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Ada Limon. Hello, hello. Crowd, thank you so much for being here. Um, in case you're worried that I'm just going to read a bunch of poems, <laughs> I won't. So you, those of you who are here for more of the NASA side, you can take a deep breath. <laughs> um, it is such an honor to be here with you today. And while I'm very sure that when I was much younger, I secretly hoped I'd be attending South by Southwest as some sort of rock star, um, there is something sweet about attending as the Poet Laureate of the United States. As poets, thank you. <laughs> as poets, our job is to make all the music complete on the page. No instruments, no harmonizing, just words and the space between them. We have to make our own bass lines our own melody, and then in the end we offer the poem to someone else so it might join their own personal internal music and make something meaningful. It's music meeting music, 
The collision of the poem with the complex human who receives it makes the whole experience of poetry completely unique to each individual reader. For me, poetry is a deeply private endeavor, a deeply personal and human endeavor. And so to transition into a more public role as an artist felt some ways like an impossible task. How do you take something that feels raw and intimate and strange and ethereal and full of chaos and mess of the human mind and show people its importance? Hold it up and say, this matters. And beyond that, how do you take that strange ethereal thing and say, I can't explain it to you. I can't even tell you what it means or ex explicate it into something easily digestible and yet still make a case for its importance. And in many ways, it's like trying to explain the soul or the heart. Making a case for poetry often feels like making a case for mystery itself, a case for deep feeling. In that sense, it feels like nature to me. You can't explain the forest even if you were deeply, intricately aware of the microclimate of the redwoods, the underground root system, the mycelium, the hummus, the layers of fog hydrating the trees from the sea, even with all that knowledge, you can still stand inside the forest and be bewildered, be in awe. The human language fails. And poetry, more than other ways of writing, embraces the place where language fails. It makes room simply for breath, for silence, for simply being. Because poetry makes room for silence, it also makes room for grief, for sorrow, for longing, for despair, for rage. Many people find it healing and sometimes deeply uncomfortable, simply because it opens something up. It dislodges and disrupts. It's not meant to comfort, but instead it's meant to re-enlarge the heart's capacity for feeling. And in doing so, I believe poetry has the ability to both reaffirm our humanity and reconnect us to each other and to the planet. And I don't mean that it does this by placating or appeasing or even soothing but rather loosening something within us that does not want to be silenced. It is the voice underneath the voice and it holds us accountable to the truth. For me, it has offered a sense of belonging to the world, to each other, to the planet. I think my entire life I've been looking for a sense of belonging, a way to find myself enmeshed in the fabric of the world. Even as a young person, I was painfully aware of the way our differences stood out and were amplified, whether it was our cultural identity, our borders, or our class differences, or our genders, or our many different ways of moving amongst each other. It felt like each one of us was being asked to be siloed into a specific box. Check this box if. Check this box. No more than one. And so on. And the question lingered, where do you come from? I mean, where do your people come from? Who do you belong to? And the truth, how I wanted to answer, I wanted to belong to the trees, to the earth. What other answer is there? I come from trees. I come from creek water, from old stars and the ocean where I found the largest sense of belonging was always in nature. I would hide myself in the rocks and the watery world of the Calabasas Creek in my hometown of Glen Ellen, California. If I felt anxious in the classroom, which I often did, I would stare out the windows of Dunbar School and focus on the leaves of the California live oaks, the acacia trees, big and blooming, loud and yellow, when the spring would warm the back roads. It was in those early days that I realized that the feeling of interconnectedness was not only propelled by a connection to fellow humans, but also to the trees, 
the clouds, the edges of landscape that blurred and came into focus depending on your gaze, the animals, the birds that were always there, but how easy not to notice them. I wanted to notice them. I thought maybe if I loved the world, it was a way of loving myself too, of even protecting what urgently needed protecting. When I was asked to create a signature project as my role as the Poet Laureate of the United States, I knew I wanted to combine poetry and nature, link the two that offer a sense of wonder and belonging and make something to share with others. I had no idea what it would look like. The first idea I had, no joke, was putting poems on native seed packets and flying a plane over wilderness landscapes that been har had been harmed by wildfires and then dropping the poems with the seed packets out onto the landscape. As you might have guessed, the wonderful folks at the Library of Congress but it might not be a great idea to put me in a plane. They thought maybe you should start with something a little more grounded, a little easier to ensure, perhaps. And so my project became a project bound to the earth. And I'm not getting in a plane. It's called You Are Here. The project combines poetry and the natural world the first element is an anthology of 50 original nature poems by some of the best contemporary poets writing today. The second element is a partnership with the National Park Service and the Poetry Society of America. We will put poetry installations in seven national parks around the country, representing the seven different regions of the national parks. Each poem is written by a legacy poet that speaks to the land and includes a prompt for visitors to write their own You Are Here poem. Even in my terrible and wonderful youth, I was drawn to the idea of being part of the Earth. I remember in high school, the photograph of Earth taken from NASA's Voyager on February 14, 1990, at a distance of 3.7 billion miles. We call it now the pale blue dot photo. Carl Sagan wrote of that photograph, look at that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us. And it is home, it's where we are. I can't help but think that part of my inspiration for the project and the name of the project came from that photograph. How can you not have an overwhelming connection when you realize that all of, all of us belong to this beautiful, extraordinary, pale blue dot. And now, while I won't be flying on planes with poems written on seed packets over deforested burn landscapes, yet, that is, the thought does bring me to one of the most inspiring collaborations of my artistic life. In October of 2022, I was asked by NASA to write an original poem that would travel 1.8 billion miles to the second moon of Jupiter. It was to be engraved on the Europa Clipper spacecraft in my own handwriting. At this point, I had turned down quite a few requests for original poems by different organizations. But when NASA asked for this endeavor, I immediately said yes. And then I was immediately thrown into a wild despair when I realized I would actually have to write the poem. <laughs> In the first meeting with the incredible NASA team, some of whom are here today, I was eagerly taking notes and they mentioned that Europa is an icy moon, which is almost entirely made of water. And they think it may have all of the ingredients for life. I took out my journal that I carry with me daily and I wrote the line, we too are made of water. That line helped guide me into the poem. The second thing that helped guide me was the idea that space is also nature, that this is all nature.
And in order to connect a poem to the second moon of Jupiter, I needed it to celebrate and praise this planet. Every NASA scientist will tell you, Earth is the best planet. After 19 drafts and a few tears, and finally my husband saying, maybe you should stop trying to write a NASA poem and start writing a poem you would actually write. I finally finished the poem. And what was it about? Of course, it's about the wonders right here, right in front of us, urgent and not to be missed. Now, one of the best things about the collaboration was getting to visit the clean room at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and watch the Europa Clipper actually being built. They didn't let me touch it, though. Listen, I know nothing about space, but I know curiosity. And what links exploration and poetry so beautifully is our curiosity. We begin with the questions and we end with more questions. We begin with wonders and end with more wonders. And now, as the project continues, the Europa Clipper team have t-shirts and sweatshirts that all have the line, we too are made of water, in, the hand, in my handwriting on the back. It's become a uniting line as the team prepares for the launch in October 10th. And while my poem is going to space, it is with great gladness and relief that I will not be going to space. <laughs> Although some headlines do make it sound like I am being launched into space. I get to remain earthbound and small here on this little pale blue dot for as long as I can, that is. With that, I would love to bring to the stage someone who actually does know a lot about space and with whom I share a boundless curiosity, a woman who is compelled to ask the big questions. Please welcome Dr. Lori Glaze, Director of Planet Science, Planetary Science for NASA. Hello everyone, it is just absolutely amazing to be here, incredible, what an opportunity, and to be here sitting with uh, Ada Lamone on Women's Days, kicking off South by Southwest. <laughs> how awesome is that? So just real quick, how we think we're going to run through this is that uh, the way it's going to work. Um, Ada and I are going to try and have some casual conversation up here. We you know, try. Ignore y'all. We're not sure you're here. <laughs> um, but we want to talk a little bit about the intersection between science and art. And then, um, hopefully, towards the end, uh, there will be some time uh, for some questions that I think are going to be submitted, and we'll be able to take some of your questions here uh, while we're sitting on the stage. Um, but isn't Ada amazing? Oh, my gosh. She's <laughs> so... Yeah. Every time I listen to her speak and I hear her words, she just has such an amazing way with language. Um, as a scientist, I'm probably not that, that good with words, but um, I know math really well. So, um, But anyway, so just a little bit, um, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. Um, as Ada said, I'm the uh, director of NASA's Planetary Science Division. Um, and what that means is I get to oversee all of NASA's programs that send robotic spacecraft out into the solar system. So we have spacecraft that explore all the way from Mercury out towards Pluto and beyond into the Kuiper Belt. And we even have a couple of spacecraft that have gone beyond uh, the edge of our solar system, the two Voyagers. One of those missions, Ada mentioned, is called the Europa Clipper mission. And Europa Clipper uh, is an incredible spacecraft, and it is uh, going to explore Europa, as Ada says, the, the second moon of Jupiter, um, an incredible place that is covered in a thick ice shell. 
But we think that beneath that ice shell is a global ocean of liquid water. Um, and that to us is really compelling. It is potentially a place where, where life could exist. Perhaps microbial life may exist there today in that ocean beneath the ice. And we're so honored and so excited that Ada's poem is going to be riding along with us all the way out to Europa. Um, as she says, it's inscribed on the spacecraft and also inscribed on the, that same plaque with her poem are co-signatures from over 2.6 million people around the world who are sending their names to Europa along with Ada's poem. So that's pretty cool too. <laughs> so let's kind of kick things off here. Um, you know, your poetry really captures the human experience. Um, as I said, you just have such an incredible way of bringing those ideas out in a way we can all relate to. So how do you think um, poetry can help us navigate these mysteries um, and the wonders of the universe? Yeah, I mean, I love it. I love talking with you, by the way. <laughs> we were in the back saying we're, this panel is, uh, is passing the Bechdel test just over and over again. Um, but I think that one of the things that I love when I'm meeting with these incredible minds that work for NASA is that I get to work in a space that has no answers. <laughs> Poetry doesn't exist in the answers at all. It literally gives space for an unknowing. And I think in that way, yes, it's a, it's a constant searching, but it's also a little bit of a surrender to the unknowing. There's a part of poetry that feels very comfortable with mysteries, that feels very at peace with not knowing things. And so I think in some ways it's, it, it's, it can feel grounding or, or uh, uplifting or soothing even when there's something disruptive within it because it feels like a, a space to reflect. It feels like a space to actually hold the mess. And um, I think in that way, you know, it goes really well with exploration because you don't know what's gonna happen. Even when you begin a poem, and many of you are probably writers, like there's a level in which you never know where it's gonna go. And so a lot of what we do as artists is just embrace the mystery, surrender to the unknown. And I think in that sense, they're, you know, to have them so linked is really beautiful. The other thing I'll add is that as we were talking, um, as Hugh made his introduction, um, about the importance of human connection. Uh, poetry is very human. It has breath built right into it, into the spaces, into the line break, into the sejuras, uh, stanza breaks. That's all a place for breath. And so it honors the actual life force of humanity. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and I'll just sit and listen to her all day. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think I want to talk a little bit about, you, you are, are talking about the importance of art um, mm. and the importance of, of not knowing and that, uh, that kind of uh, mystery. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of how science, I think, is very similar, right? We, we are constantly uh, coming up with these amazing questions, and then we, we d design these incredible spacecraft that go out into the solar system to explore, and we start to answer some of those questions, but inevitably, every time, we come back with even more questions mm -hmm. than we started with. We learned one piece that's new, and then we have to kind of reset. We have to kind of reflect on what we've learned and then reset our thinking, and, and start again. Okay, let's rethink how, what the questions are we really need to be asking, we start again. And I think the Europa Clipper mission is a really great example of that. Um, it actually is building on a mission that we flew um, a long time ago now, getting to be called Galileo, um, that flew to Jupiter, and uh, it was that mission that actually discovered this global ocean uh, beneath the ice. And up to that point, we had this thought in our mind that in order for life to exist, 
you know, the, the planet on which life could exist had to be in some zone, um, some distance from the sun where water could be present on the surface, um, liquid water, because we know that life needs water. But when we discovered that here, way out in the solar system, out at Jupiter distance, which only gets about, oh, I don't know, less than 5% of the sunlight that we get here on Earth. How could you possibly have life in that kind of an environment? And then we realized that there was, in fact, this global ocean beneath the ice. And we started to rethink, maybe you don't have to be at an Earth distance um, in order to have life exist mm -hmm. in the solar system. Maybe you could have life mm -hmm. that far out. We find life in incredibly extreme environments on, mm -hmm. on Earth. Um, in the coldest environments at the tops of the mountains and at the bottom of the ocean where it's dark and under very high pressure. And so we started to think maybe, maybe there could be life in the ocean of Europa. And so this mission, Clipper, is really designed to not necessarily look for the signs of life, but to actually look for those the different things that you need for life. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be exploring, with, we're loaded with, I think, nine major instruments that are going to look for how deep is that ocean? How salty is that ocean? How thick is the icy crust? Do you see on the surface of the ice, do you see the organic materials that are the building blocks that would be able to come together to, to actually form life if they were, the, if they were present in the mm. right location? Mm. So I love that. Yeah. yeah. So we're. I still we're don't want to go though. <laughs> You're going to get to go with us uh, through the data that we're going to share and the, the images that we'll share with the world. Um, but again, you know, just thinking, you know, the poetry and arts. Here we we're trying to come together, and in fact, I think there's not that much difference between science and art. I tell mm. many people, science is is much more like art, in that. If we already knew all the answers, um, it wouldn't be science. And mm -hmm. so it, it really is bringing together um, the, you know, that trying to understand mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you'd talk for a little bit about how arts can enhance um, our comprehension of discovery and, and as we embark on the unknown a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I really do think that they um, need to be connected more because I think that there is a level in which we well, you were talking about reflection and resetting, mm -hmm. right? And that's such a place where poetry lives. Mm -hmm. It lives in that place to reflect and reset. And I think that there's also a moment in which we aren't separated from our feelings. <laughs> and yet sometimes we think that science and math and numbers are separate from that. Mm -hmm. But this, like we talked about the Clipper, is a human endeavor, right? This is an exploration of curiosity and wonder. And there's a team behind it that's making it happen. There, you know, since its inception, so many people have been thinking about this second moon, this particular place, um, and how to get there, what, you know, how to, all of these things. And I feel like that to me is so essential because we forget sometimes when we're looking at um, maybe a completed spacecraft or a completed mission and we see the collection of parts or we see the um, uh, you know we see the completed uh, mathematic equation but someone did that <laughs> and I think poetry is always pointing back to the human behind the making of the thing right it's always about how do we make something what is our offering and in that sense, I feel like it's, it's really a wonderful connection because it's not just about um, the final product. <laughs> it's about the willingness to fail and to create and then create again. And it's also an offering. You can write poems for yourself, and many people do. I write poems for, for myself. You might imagine I'm writing lots of secret poems right now. <laughs> that no one can see. Um, but really when a poem comes to life is when it is offered and it collides with another human soul. That's when the poem becomes complete. And I feel that is the sort of connection as well, mm -hmm. is that there's a level in which it has to, it has to be offered out. It can't just be in the mind. It can't just be for the self. 
but has to have a larger goal of connection. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And now I can now get to ask you a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now, how do you think the collaborations between artists and scientists can enhance, enhance our collective pursuit of knowledge and understanding? And I ask you that because I feel like as a poet, I can talk all day long about why I think poetry is important. Um, but now tell me about poetry. No. <laughs> uh, but I, I would love to know how you see those things. And I know you have a deep history of it, of course, mm -hmm. at NASA. We do. Um, in fact, we're always trying to reach out and, and get our our information as far out as we can. In fact, we have a long history of trying to communicate beyond all of us here on Earth, going all the way back actually to one of our early spacecraft, the Pioneer missions, the Pioneer 10 and 11. Um, Pioneer 10 actually launched in 1972, um, and this was an amazing spacecraft. It flew, um, was the first spacecraft to travel through the main asteroid belt, and it then was the first to fly by Jupiter, in fact, our first spacecraft. And it carried with it a plaque that had information on it that um, uh, kind of recorded where we were in time and space at the time of that launch. And in fact, it's on the graphic up there. It's kind of hard to see through all the hardware, but it's back in the back there. That's what you've been <laughs> looking at for a while. Um, but that was kind of our first attempt to kind of reach out and say, if someone finds this spacecraft in the future, here's something to let you know where it came from, connect us back to Earth. And then, of course, the two Voyager spacecraft was another time mm -hmm. that we, um, most people are probably familiar with these golden records um, that actually, again, tried to carry a message um, to anyone that might be out in space. Um, and again, trying to broaden um, and think beyond just the science and the technology and the data and the bits and the bytes that get sent back to Earth. And we're still continuing this tradition today. In fact, we have a spacecraft that launched a couple of years ago called Lucy. Um, and the Lucy spacecraft is going to study some special um, asteroids um, that are at a distance, Jupiter distance, but they're not going to Jupiter, these special asteroids out there at that distance. And the Lucy mission also is carrying a plaque. And this one I really like because it actually has some quotes from some of the greatest minds of our era. Um, from philosophers and writers, um, musicians, poets. Um, and so again, trying to make those connections between the, how we're all connected between the arts and between science. And another way for us to reach audiences that um, we might not typically meet if we were only, only talking to the scientists and the engineers mm -hmm. and those that were really mm -hmm. specifically interested in mm -hmm. space. So I, I love that, um, it, and I also just wanted to say that um, you know this line between science and art I've already said is a little blurry, and I think you know the message in a bottle campaign that we have with Europa Clippers sending a message from one water world to another is a really good example of that, and how it's so important to have creative minds and all the different people required to put one of these spacecraft together. It's not just the scientists and engineers, it's business managers and artists and you know just the whole collection of people, including our communications experts yeah. that are able to send our messages out. Um, I did want to give a quick plug. There's a, a, another session here today, this afternoon, called NASA Vision by Design, which is really focused on our artists um, and our our communication capability, so encourage people to, to take a look at that. I love that. Um, I know we get to, uh, we have a video, which I'm very excited about, but I want to ask you a question mm -hmm. before. Um, to go back to the Europa Clipper, um, how, okay, so all of these exploration sounds amazing, mm -hmm. but one of the things that keeps coming up for me and that keeps being said about the Europa Clipper and about Europa in general is that it does have all of the ingredients for life. Yeah. And that it is a potentially habitable place. Can you talk a little bit more about that yeah. endeavor? <laughs> exactly. Well, I think, you know, Europa Clipper is actually um, a great example of us trying to get one step closer to answering the big question, the one that we all ask <laughs> all the time. You know, are we alone in the universe? And we just take these incremental steps and we keep trying to get a little bit more information, a little more knowledge about, you know, 
Are we, are we there? Are, what does it really take? And going to some place like Europa is an opportunity to say, okay, does this place really have all the things that we think are needed uh, for life? I already mentioned it's got water. We think water is important. Organic molecules, those building blocks for life that, that build up to, to turn into the life that we know here on Earth. And an energy source, is there, is there energy that drives um, some kind of a, a life cycle um, mm. in that deep ocean? Maybe volcanoes at the base of the ocean that mm. are providing thermal energy and chemical energy um, inside the ocean. So mm. just again, just one more step on our journey to, to trying to, to understand uh, where we are. Um, before we run out of time, oh. I, I want to um, I want to make sure we get to a, another important part that um, I think is always important to talk about. And you mentioned in your opening remarks about kind of that sense of doubt mm -hmm. and that sense of oh my gosh, what did I say I was going to do, and will mm -hmm. I be able to actually deliver something? And mm -hmm. you know, I just want to say that you know from the NASA side and from the science side, you know that doubt, the you know the the fact that failure is always an option. We say sometimes it's not, but it happens, right? And in fact, that's one of the most important things um, that we do as scientists and engineers is being able to learn from those failures. Yeah. Um, you know, we you don't land on the moon or Mars without a lot of hard work and trial and error and things that happen. But you've got to put yourself out there in order mm -hmm. to make that happen. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about you know, how that plays into into your world and, and if yeah. you had doubts um, as you were yeah. going forward writing your poem for Clipper. I mean, making a poem to go to space, <laughs> to, just saying that out loud is insane to me, um, was clearly hard. <laughs> it was very difficult. It wasn't like, oh, I know exactly how this will go. I, you know, I had very few parameters. One of the things was that it, it had to not be very long, as you might imagine. They couldn't create a second spacecraft to carry the rest of my poem. <laughs> um, and I was really trying to focus on, you know, who is this for? And I think the, one of the things that I kept getting confused about is that I feel as a writer and most of my life as a poet that I feel, I, I feel often very distrustful of the we. I wonder who the we includes. Is it representative of us all? <laughs> are women included? You know, um, as a Latina woman, you know, who are we included when we say we, we the people? I wonder. And. Um, so when I kept trying to write the drafts and drafts of this poem, I kept failing and trying to figure out what was happening. And I realized like, oh, this is a chance. There's a chance really that it is a we, that it has to be a we. And so I had to kind of soften my thinking about my distrust over we and realize how essential we is, the collective for all of us, for humanity, and that it wasn't just including humans. That for me, the we includes all of life on Earth. And that was where the poem started to take off for me. Um, and up until then, it was just draft after draft of essentially the worst poems you've ever read. <laughs> um, and, you know, even when I was working in form, the poems in Tercets, the three felt essential to me. It felt like there was, there needed to be um, a, a sort of energy that was unlocked with the three. So the poem began in tercets. Um, and then what it really needed to do was to point back to the planet, back to us. And um, that felt essential in making the poem. But there were, there were so many drafts and I've been asked, you know, oh, do you want to, share the drafts, you know. The, I'm sure the Library of Congress would love to share the drafts. I'm always like, no, you know. Perhaps when I'm no longer on the pale blue dot, <laughs> we can see those drafts. Um, but yeah, uh, I think failure is really important for us as an artist and as human beings. Like We have to know when to pivot. Um, we have to know when something's not working. Um, 
And I, I have a lot of poetry friends that always dislike the fact that I admit that I throw away things all the time. And when it's not working, I just, I throw them away. I start again. Um, and it's one of the reasons I decided to keep a notebook so that I wasn't just tempted to constantly just delete or, you know, just, just toss away everything. Um, no record. Uh, but yeah, I think failure is essential yeah. to, to making art. And I know it's essential to... Oh, it's, it's a big yeah. part of what, yeah. <laughs> what we do every day. Yeah. <laughs> every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, and don't worry, you are going to get to listen to Ada read the poem, <laughs> but not yet. Not yet. First, I have a special surprise for you. Uh, we're going to unveil um, a special video that's just being released right now, here, today. Y'all will be the first ones to see it, that talks about this plaque that's going to carry Ada's poem. So if we can get that queued up. I'm hoping that it will play. One engine ignition. There's a legacy of NASA spacecraft carrying inspirational messages from Earth, going back to the Pioneer plaque and the Voyager Golden Record. Now, Europa Clipper, a new mission from one ocean world to another, will continue this tradition. Because water connects our planet and Jupiter's moon Europa, all life as we know it, and all human cultures. A part of the spacecraft has been engraved with designs inspired by water and human connections. This metal plate is part of a structure that will protect the spacecraft's electronics from the threat of Jupiter's radiation. On one side of the plate is a design we call water words. These rippling lines represent recordings of the word for water in a diverse collection of human languages. The other side of the plate is a montage of elements that complete our message in a bottle. At the top is the Drake Equation, a tribute to the visionary idea that the probability of finding life in the cosmos is something we can estimate. Next, these two lines represent radio frequencies emitted in space by molecules related to water, which have been considered an ideal place to search for interstellar communications, as suggested by some researchers. They represent our ability to use the language of science to search for signs of life. Next is a portrait of one of the founders of planetary science, Dr. Ron Greeley, whose early efforts to develop a Europa mission laid the foundation for Europa Clipper. At the heart of this message in a bottle is a poem in the handwriting of U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamone. The poem connects the two water worlds. Earth, yearning to reach out and understand what makes a world habitable. And Europa, waiting with secrets yet to be explored. Finally, the bottle, orbited by the four largest moons of Jupiter, to which will be attached a microchip etched with more than 2.6 million names of those who signed on in the spirit of the poem as our message is sent on its voyage to Europa. As technically advanced as the spacecraft is, every part of it is made by people. And all of the markings on the plate are either handwritten, hand-drawn, or represent human voices and names. Because exploration Lift off. is something we do together, something that connects us all as we head out into the cosmic sea. saw at the very end there was a little tagline that says go to the website for making waves makes it's called make waves and that's where you can go and listen to all of those sound recordings of uh, the word water in all the different languages and now while you were watching that I put on gloves so that I can pick this up and show you here's the plaque So I will tell you, we talked about you know, how important it is to try and fail and try and go again. This is the trial version. <laughs> Everything is on here. 
Um, they wouldn't let me actually touch the one that's going into they space. They don't let us touch a lot of things. At There's NASA. a lot of things they don't let you touch. This is what I've, this is what I've learned. And even the practice version, I have to wear <laughs> gloves. But, but here it is. Here's the, the words on one side and Ada's poem on the back. And you got to see this. Not everybody's going to get to see what this actually looks like. Um, whoops. <laughs> They'll never let me touch it. Um, but how cool is that? It's right here in Austin, Texas. So very cool. So with that, we are going to cap off this section with Ada reading her poem, and then I've, I brought my tissue so I can cry, because I do every time I listen to it. Um, and then we're going to take a few questions until we get to the top of the hour. Um, so hopefully those have been submitted through the website, and we will, um, oh, they're starting to pop up. So Ada, I'm going to hand it over to you to, to read, and, and I'm ready. Um, I just also want to say that this is so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. And we were talking about failure before, and I forgot to tell you that you can imagine it was one thing writing the poem, but then they said, we would like it in your own handwriting. You know, please send it in your own handwriting. And I don't know what sort of strange confidence beast was in me that thought I could just hammer it out in my own handwriting. No big deal. And if I thought the poem draft itself took 19 drafts, imagine just writing a card to someone and screwing up your, the, you know, the I or, you know, whatever you were doing in cursive. And um, I think that this, I mean, I, I feel like it took me three hours to finally get the version of the handwriting that actually is now here etched into the vault plate. So, you know, the hand cramp at the end of the day. Um, I'm going to stand to read this poem. In Praise of Mystery, a poem for Europa. Arching under the night sky, inky with black expansiveness, we point to the planets we know. We pin quick wishes on stars. From Earth, we read the sky as if it is an unerring book of the universe, expert and evident. Still, there are mysteries below our sky. The whale song, the songbird singing its call in the bow of a wind-shaken tree. We are creatures of constant awe, curious at beauty, at leaf, and blossom at grief and pleasure, sun and shadow. And it is not darkness that unites us, not the cold distance of space, but the offering of water. Each drop of rain, each rivulet, each pulse, each vein. Oh, second moon, we too are made of water of vast and beckoning seas. We too are made of wonders, of great and ordinary loves, of small invisible worlds, of a need to call out through the dark. Thank you. Right there. <laughs> I am serious. I get choked up every time I listen. To it. Yeah, we too are made of water. Um, it's just—it's a glorious, glorious testament to uh, to all the amazing things that we're doing. Um, so we do have a couple questions here. Um, let's see. The the first one I think might actually kind of go to both of us. Um, as a woman artist working in aerospace, what do you think professionals can do to inspire slash empower young people to go into creative art jobs in a STEM field? Mm. So I'd like your perspective, and then maybe I can reflect a little as well. Yeah, one thing that I, have, I feel very passionately about is that I really don't believe that we always have to choose one thing. I think that there is a certain amount of thinking that is like, well, if you do this, you commit to that forever, 
and everything else that you've done in your life sort of falls by the wayside. And I actually think that for the most part, to be a complete and whole human being, you have to embrace all the many sides of you that are interested in many different things. And I think that that is the better thing to hold in your heart as you move forward in whatever artistic or scientific pursuit um, that you're interested in, is that you can be interested in many, many different things, to not close your mind off to other avenues because you're passionate about one thing. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, I think all of us, in fact, most of the scientists and engineers that I work with have many, many passions and many, many interests, and I think that's so important. But I also, I get a lot of opportunities to speak with um, school children, um, you know, all the way up through high school and even entering college, and a lot of them say, I love NASA, I'm so inspired by what you do, but there's no place for me in NASA because I'm really not that great at math or science. And I say, you know, we're not all scientists and engineers. In fact, there's no way we could launch the spacecraft that we launch if we were only scientists and engineers. It takes every single person's capabilities to come together um, to make us successful. Mm. And if we did all the great science and no one knew about it, that wouldn't be very great either. So having people in communications and in fields of art, those, that m amazing video was created by um, artists out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We have incredible artists that work within NASA that help to communicate our story and help to communicate all of our science to everyone, to as broad of an audience as we can. So I would always encourage anyone that uh, is an artist that has an interest in mm. science and technology, stick with it. There are, there are plenty of great opportunities there. Mm. Let's see, um, let's take another question. When we think about fiction and future, it usually comes in the form of dystopia. How important is it to build narratives of a desirable future? Mm. And this is from Paula in Brazil. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I find that most of the time when we read futuristic novels, that future is pretty dire. Um, and I think that I, for one, I've been laughing with my other writer friends that we've said the apocalypse so many times in our poems that we've conjured it. <laughs> so we have to be careful. Um, and I think that one of the big things that I take away is that actually surrendering to despair is the easier choice. It is harder to have hope and to have wonder and to lean into curiosity and think about what might be possible. And that to me feels like the true effort and the true purpose for being is to lean into hope when there feels like there can be so little of it in a lot of the models that were shown in terms of our fiction or in terms of um, a lot of what we're told about what might happen in the future. So for me, I think that Hope is hard, but it's hard won. And um, I, for one, think that we have to collectively make an effort to envision a different possible future. And if we don't do that, and instead we choose to give up, um, how dangerous that will look like. That will be so dangerous. And so I think actually it's, it's the only choice we have is to have hope. Cool. Great answer. I really like this next question, Ada. Um, as a software engineer and a former aspiring writer for film and TV, I've noticed that both engineers and artists get writer's block. How do you tackle that? Mm. <laughs> I, you know, I'm very lucky in a lot of ways. Um, for the most part, I don't have a poem due for NASA <laughs> in my life. Um, and so I am... You know, I'll say that I actually think that we live in a world where um, we're thinking about perpetually making something, that it's always about production. And I actually think that artists need to step back and to embrace silence and receive the world. And there are moments where we actually are not supposed to be creating. We're supposed to be listening and receiving and reading and watching and going for walks and absorbing the world. 
And how can you constantly, how can you even receive the world if you're constantly putting something in it, right? There needs to be a moment where we stop making in order to bring that next thing into fruition. And so I believe in rest. I believe that rest is radical. I think that we need to take moments to be completely at peace with silence and not making something. Um, and that in that silence and in that rest, the next thing will come. Yeah, oh, that's great. I'm going to give Ada a rest here. I'll take one here. It says, um, do you ever get concerned about private space travel doing to other planets what is happening to Earth? And how does that reflect in the art? And how does it reflect, I'm going to guess, in what we're doing as well? Um, so I think we're really about to embark on a, on a new age of space exploration, which to me is incredibly exciting. Um, I don't know how many people know that I think there were six attempts to land on the moon over the last year. Did anybody know that? Um, see if I can name them here now. Um, we had two from the United States, two commercial companies just recently attempted to land on the moon. One of them landed softly, which was nice. Um, the ja uh, Japanese had a commercial company that tried to land on the moon. Um, and that one landed hard. And then the Japanese Space Agency landed. They had a nice soft landing. Uh, Russia tried to land, hard landing. Um, and the Indian Space Agency um, landed softly. So to me, this is incredible. We have a global community now that's very interested in going to the moon. We have commercial companies that are interested in going to the moon. I do think that it is important that we, as humanity, um, take very seriously, as, as Ada said before, you know, nature doesn't stop at the edge of Earth. Mm -hmm. um, it goes beyond. And the planets around us, um, the other places in our solar system are also part of our nature. And so we absolutely want to preserve those um, and preserve uh, the, the ability to do science and the ability to enjoy them as amazing natural objects. Mm. Um, so we are trying as NASA to try and set at least an ideal um, mm. for how to be respectful in that exploration mm. um, and hopefully bring other, other nations and other explorers along with us. But I do think it's an amazing thing to think that, you know, 60 years ago we hadn't begun exploring the solar system and now we are starting to actually see more of the world um, starting to get beyond Earth. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on no, that. No, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I know personally as an artist, my first thought and as someone who, you know, considers herself a climate activist, I do, there was a first moment I was like, oh no, will my poem be space junk? <laughs> um, and I think you worry about that. I think it's something to talk about. So I, I really appreciate the question because I do think we have to, um, you know, there needs to be guardrails in place in which we're not just protecting um, our planet, but beyond because we're having so much more access to space now. Yeah, no, that's great. All right, we're getting close to the end. Only a couple minutes left. I think I'll take um, one more here that says, uh, will any of the photography from the Europa mission actually have art as its objective? Mm, um, so question. that's a really great question. I love that question. Yeah, and so while we maybe don't actually take a photo just to take an art picture, I can guarantee you there will be some incredibly artistic images that will come from the Europa Clipper mission. I will note that we actually have a mission at Jupiter today, and you can look this up online. There's a mission called Juno, and it is carrying a camera that is actually not a science instrument. It is sole purpose is for um, public outreach. It is a public outreach camera, and it has taken some amazingly beautiful images of Jupiter. They're not processed by the science team. They're made available to the entire world. And there's a whole community of what we call citizen scientists who take those images and they process them and turn them into incredible pieces of art. And if you haven't seen them yet, you really should look, look those up. And I feel confident that with Europa Clipper, um, I think there's art in all of our science. There's art everywhere around us in everything that we can, can look at with the instruments uh, from Europa Clipper. So really looking forward to it. 
So I think with that, Ada, I think yeah. we've about used up our time. I know I just, there's folks yeah. ready to go to the next session. I just wanted to end with this quote because it, I actually wrote it down and it, it, it fit nowhere in what I was talking about today, but I thought, oh, when we had that question about hope, I was thinking, this is one of my favorite quotes, and being that it's International Women's Day and you know, being with you on stage, and just as we move forward and maybe hold this with you throughout the day, which is a quote by Angela Davis, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a new era of pioneers, star sailors, thinkers, and adventurers. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Let's go.